This is Quarry Bank in Cheshire, England. I've been doing research here for my new book, The Armour of Light. Today, Quarry Bank is an idyllic tourist destination and a fascinating museum run by the National Trust. And it was a mill, a lot like this one, where the characters in The Armour of Light would have worked. 14 hours a day, Monday to Friday, and 12 hours on Saturday, weaving cloth at machines. I like stories about people living through great historical crises, wars, plagues, revolutions. They have to continue with their everyday lives, making a living, falling in love, raising their children while the whole world is in convulsions all around them. I was drawn to the Industrial Revolution by the conflicts it created. Bread riots, machine smashing, and violent resistance to conscription. But first, I wanted to understand the machines that revolutionized ordinary people's lives. So, to spin, you're going to need to turn the wheel and at the same time, with your left hand, you need to have your thread just sitting under the spindle. So as you turn the wheel, it's going to flick off the end and add some twist. There we go, add a bit more twist. You're doing very well, actually. Good, good, yeah. Draw back a bit more. For hundreds of years, this was done with a spinning wheel. And that's what Sal Clitheroe does at the beginning of the Armour of Light. That's it, now you're... Oh, that's not bad. It was slow, patient work, always done by women in their cottages and badly paid. But when Sal and her seven-year-old child are banished from their village and forced to move to Kingsbridge, she learns that her wheel is becoming obsolete. The spinning jenny enables one woman to spin eight threads at a time. So this is the spinning jenny and it, what it does is multiple threads at one time as opposed to one thread like you do on your spinning wheel. But it works in exactly the same way because you've still got your wheel which turns your spindles. Yeah. The threads flick off the end creating the twist. Yeah. But this time I've got a clasp. I'm clasping hold these two bits of wood that pinch the, the cotton rovings and then I'm pulling back, adding the twist as I go. Yeah. And then we wind it in by using a foot pedal that pulls the bar down. And then we can wind the threads onto the spindles like so. Sal no longer works at home, but in a mill with dozens of others. And the spinning machines got bigger and bigger and bigger. In Kingsbridge, Sal meets Jarge, a weaver. The art of intertwining threads to make cloth is also changing. Done by men in their homes for hundreds of years, it's being industrialized with the invention of the steam loom. People like Sal and Jarge are freed from the bullying culture of the village and the tyranny of the squire. Now they can move from place to place in search of work. Sal's son, Kit, learns to read at a Sunday school started by Elsie Latimer, idealistic daughter of a bishop. A clever young mill hand can make a fortune by constructing new labour-saving machines. But there's a downside. A mill owner such as Joseph Hornby may be a harder taskmaster than any squire. When the market price of cloth falls, the mill owners pay less, often much less. And people such as Sal and Jarge struggle to make ends meet or smash the machines they blame for their hardship. To make matters worse, the cost of a loaf of bread keeps going up, mainly because of laws that make wheat expensive, laws passed by a parliament of landowners whose income goes up with the price of grain. When women like Jarge's sister Joni find they can't afford to feed their families, they riot and steal bread from bakeries in what becomes known as the Revolt of the Housewives. 
And at the same time as all that, there's a huge European war that goes on for 23 years. The leaders of Europe are terrified by the French Revolution and they make up their minds to restore the French monarchy. But they come up against one of the greatest generals of all time, Napoleon Bonaparte. Wartime hardship sparks strikes and riots in Kingsbridge and elsewhere. And the government panics when a London mob stones the king's carriage, chanting, bread and peace. Many of my characters go to war, though not always willingly. Kit is conscripted into the Homeland Militia. The notorious press gang kidnaps Jim Pigeon and forces him into the Royal Navy. Men convicted of crimes are sentenced to serve in the army. One way and another, many of my characters end up on the 18th of June, 1815, on the battlefield of Waterloo. In between writing the first and second drafts, I spent a week on the battlefield, researching the area. My advisor, James Cowan, is an expert in this subject and is also involved in making a huge model of the battlefield, which I saw at the National Army Museum. Once we'd returned from our trip, I had many questions for him. At the start of the day, would you say that the two sides were evenly matched? Pretty evenly matched, Ken. Uh, the French slightly outnumbered the British. However, uh, the British had the Prussians on their side, but they were 12 miles away at the town of Wavre. In the early hours of the morning, on the 18th of June, 1815, two of my fictional characters are sent by Wellington to the town of Wavre to make sure that the Prussians are on their way. Well, the Prussian army's journey is very fraught. They have to cross a narrow bridge, um, and then there is a fire in the middle of town, so they have to turn around and find a different route. So by the time they actually get started on their journey, in the mid-morning, that was the time they were supposed to arrive at the battlefield of Waterloo. On a sunny day last July, you and I walked the route that the Prussians took from Wavre to Waterloo. It took us three and a half hours. But of course it was much longer for them because at that time the roads were very muddy and they had 88 horse-drawn cannons to take with them. Yeah, and that meant that for most of the day this is a battle between the French and the British with a series of assaults by the French onto the British line. And in the early evening, Napoleon launches his Imperial Guard onto the surviving British. And at this moment it appears that the British may well be broken. And when exactly did the Prussians arrive? The Prussians began to arrive mid-afternoon, but only in small numbers because of the narrow lanes. But by early evening, they were arriving in very large numbers in the village of Plancenoit, and that had a decisive effect. It was in the rear of Napoleon's position. He had to send more and more troops there, and as a result, the battle was both lost by Napoleon and won by Wellington and Blücher. This was the end of Napoleon's career, as well as the end of an extraordinary battle. Napoleon was defeated and imprisoned, and the unpopular and incompetent Louis XVIII was restored to the French throne. Some of my characters die at Waterloo. The survivors return home to the same old battles between mill owners and mill workers, with the odds stacked in favour of the owners. However, after a long political campaign, the Hated Combination Act was repealed, and trade unions became legal again. The Armour of Light completes an eight-volume cycle of novels which together chronicle the last thousand years of Western civilization. I didn't plan it that way. I always just wrote the most exciting story that I could think of. But this bookcase contains one copy of each of the editions and translations of the books that I've written over the past 50 years. And when I look at this bookcase and think about these stories, I can see that there's a, there's a theme to this body of work, and that theme is freedom. I get angry about bullying, dictators, war, racism, injustice, and I really admire 
people who have protested against those things, the suffragettes, civil rights protesters, union leaders, religious minorities, and of course the rebels from Jack Cade to Martin Luther King. I've spent my life recreating their struggles in my stories. And I know the battle isn't over yet, but if we take the long view and consider the progress that we've made since the Middle Ages, one thing is clear, we're winning, we are winning.